Welcome to another episode of Camera for the Talk podcast. Today's guest has been a documentary and editorial photographer, filmmaker for over 50 years. Well known for how he embraced colour photography in his practice in the 60s, which led to the beginning of an illustrious and adventurous career as a photographer and filmmaker. My guest today is John Bulmer. Welcome, John. Thank you. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine, almost pretty much being blown away down here, but um, surviving in, in a house anyway. You're in Herefordshire now? I'm in Herefordshire, yes. How long have you been there? Well, I, I was brought up, I was born and brought up in Herefordshire, but then I bought my own house here in 1965. And although for, the, um, you know, for many years I just came down at weekends or when I could get away, when I retired from filmmaking, I moved here full time. And I, and I love it here. Yeah. It's very quiet, I guess, from the lifestyle you've led. That's right. Last time I was in Hereford, I photographed a huge inflatable bull. <laughs> but we won't go there. What are you up to these days? Well, I I still work with my still photographs. I um, you know I make prints and I do books now and again. But my hobby really is carriage driving uh, with horses, and um, there's quite a lot of to be lot of lot to be done in renovating the old house and so on, which is which is lovely. So I keep quite busy. What what are you doing with horses? Well, I do carriage driving, um, so I drive out around the countryside and try and train the horses. And then in the summers, I go to some British driving society shows. And the ambition from that is to try and qualify for Horse of the Year show. When did all that start? When did it start? Um, I've probably been doing this for 30 years, something like that. Has there been a documentary project on that? Yes, I did a film for a series called The Horse in Sport back in the right. 80s, which was, um, it was a series, but one of them was about four-in-hand driving. And we included Prince Philip, plus the, the British champion, George Bowman, and the American champion. And we travelled all over the world for this series. It, uh, uh, it was great fun to do. There was one on driving, one on rodeo, one on show jumping, um, uh, and it was just great fun to do. What made you decide to move away from photography into filmmaking? Well, I'd worked for 10 years for the Sunday Times Colour Supplement, and there were several things together, really. One was, you know, when you've done something for a long while, you want to sort of look about changing direction a bit, but also the Sunday Times magazine changed its direction. They... um, they were under a lot of pressure, I think, from the advertisers to make the editorial more compatible with the sort of lifestyle of advertising. And I remember they had a new editor, Hunter Davis, at one point, who called me into his office and said, right, what we're looking for now is stories on crime, middle class living and fashion. And I'd been traveling the world and having a wonderful time. And I just felt, well, this wasn't for me. Well, I remember in the early 2000s, people were, photographers were thinking about moving into film because of the pressures of the industry then. So yeah. it was quite interesting that you were thinking about this in, 10 in the years. Early, in the early 70s, yeah, 20 years early before. early 70s, yeah. Yes, and a few people did. I mean, Lord Snowden made some films. Uh, Philip Jones Griffiths made a film. But I think the thing was, they, in those days, first of all, there was a, it was very unionised and there, was a big, there were big crews and I wanted to shoot my own films. I didn't want to be part of a, a big team. Uh, and, but fortunately, because I'd been an engineer party, I think I was technically su- sufficiently able to be able to use the camera myself and actually be yeah. a director cameraman, yeah. um, uh, which wasn't that easy. It's become much easier now with video and things like that. Tell me about your archive. You must have a pretty vast archive. Yes, well, uh, see, I, I worked for really, f- 15 years in still photography and then I moved more or less all into filmmaking. And when I retired from filmmaking, which is about 2005, I thought long and hard about what to do with all my archive of, of still pictures. And I'd seen friends who who had given their archives to academic institutions or libraries or things like that. And they all, all, they all went into sort of wonderful archives, but the people who had them didn't really seem to understand pictures. They understood preserving things and saving negatives, but they didn't have much idea of actually promoting pictures and seeing them. So I made a decision to, 
to sell my archive to Popper Photo, who market through Getty Images, because I felt that that way, the in a hundred years' time, those pictures would be available and be seen. Whereas, if I left them to my family, there was nobody in my family who would know what to do with them, and hundreds of boxes of pictures. Whereas, uh, with Popper Photo, they've spent a lot of time looking through them and archiving them properly and cataloging them and they're all now available on Get Getty Images so I think for the sake of the pictures and the future that this was definitely the right thing. But I did keep the rights to have exhibitions and sell prints and do books so that keeps me quite busy in itself um, and it doesn't interfere with the, the long-term futures of the images with, with Getty Images. Did you assist them in the scanning process and the editing process? Well, I'd done a lot of scanning uh, before I sold the archive, and then they are in the process now of going through more of the negatives. And interestingly enough, there are now pictures on Getty images that I don't actually remember even taking because I haven't got yeah. round to scanning them. But I, I did a lot, lot. I probably, uh, I probably put several thousand pictures on Getty images before that and they probably doubled that now so there are, there's, there's quite a good lot of stuff on there. It must be amazing looking back at your life like that. Well it? <laughs> it's fun anyway yes. Yeah just put, putting yourself in them situations because you've you traveled everywhere haven't you? you? You did a lot of assignments in South America, Africa, Yes, Europe, well, everybody. Uh, the early days of the Sunday Times magazine was extraordinary because, first of all, they had lots of money, but secondly, all the airlines were starting to open up routes all all around the world. And I mean, for example, in 1963, I was given free three three world round the world airfares by airlines simply because they wanted pictures of the world to, to be published, and they wanted to. They felt it would encourage other people to travel, and so. Um, you know, I did a massive amount of travelling in that period. That's not uncommon from the time because I know Magnum photographers who I knew from that period who were quite industrious at the time, they were offered lots of little treats and, and things like that as yep. well. So yes. it wasn't uncommon then. What interests me was when you got the Sunday Times contract that your contract was for 60 pages a year, which... If you think about it, it doesn't seem a lot, but there's only 52 Sundays in a year. So that was a pretty, pretty amazing deal at the time, do you think? It was, yes. And I, I um, you know, I, I filled it filled it for several years and spent, well, I certainly spent at least 50% of my time travelling the world from them around the mid-60s. Mid so it was a pretty exciting time. Well, you would have to filling 60 pages a year because that's quite a, I was at first. I looked at it and I'm thinking, sixty pages again. And then I thought, yeah, how many Sundays are there in a year? It, it's what a hell of a contract. I mean, it must have been really life changing for you. It was, yes, and it, it was it was a great opportunity. I must say. What I would like to do is go back before Cambridge. Go back when you were a child, and I want to just follow the route from where you got your calling as a yes photographer and take me on that journey and we'll we'll move it up to the present time right yeah well as a child i was interested in sort of mechanical things like playing with meccano and toy trains and building myself radio sets and so on we didn't have computers obviously or those kind of computer games so i was interested in very practical things and then when i was a teenager somebody gave me a, a box brownie camera and to start with, I was really fascinated by the mechanical aspects of it and then how to develop my films and uh, and then to, to printing and so on. And I made myself a darkroom in a cupboard and I made an enlarger out of Meccano and tin cans. And I became fascinated by all the mechanical aspects of it. And then suddenly I discovered the image. And I think the, the most... Um, crucial things in that really was there was an exhibition called The Family of Man that was on in London and became a book with wonderful pictures from all over the world and there was a book Cartier-Bresson published his book on China and things and having seen these rather staid pictures that the Royal Photographic Society were, were showing and the London Salon of Photography to see things like Cartier-Bresson it was just a real eye-opener to me and that's what gave me a passion and I knew that I wanted to be a photographer. 
Um, and so I was lucky in that I was able to get a job in my school holidays with a local freelance in Hereford called Derek Evans, who is a, a press photographer. And that, that was all exciting and going out and doing stories myself. And uh, that really got me hooked. So when time came to go off to university, I was not sure I really wanted to do that at all, but I wanted to be a photographer. But my, my parents, I think quite rightly, said, well, get yourself a proper degree, and then if you still want to do it, go for it. So I went off to Cambridge, but I'm afraid I spent most of my time taking photographs and not much on studying engineering, which is what I was meant to be doing. Just going back to when you made the enlarge out of tin cans. Yeah. How did you do that? Well, um, you know, an enlarger is basically a tin can with a light inside and then a, you know, something to hold the negative and something to hold the lens. And uh, I used a sort of Meccano rack to, to move the lens up and down and stuck the, the tin cans together with glue and it, it worked fine. Wow. Well, you were at Cambridge. You were... Were you commissioned by Life magazine? Well, eventually, what it wasn't, it was it was an unofficial commission. But I started off working for the university paper Varsity. So, well, a friend of mine called Tim Green, who was a, a journalist, who was another postgraduate student, he'd done some work for Life magazine and had the contacts there, and um, he thought it might be interesting to do a story on the night climbers. That's the students who climb up the buildings at night. So we set about doing this, and Life magazine helped us. They gave me these vast flat Flash bulbs with wire inside, and they printed up the pictures huge, and uh, so uh, that was fantastic. Except that the uh, we also published some of the pictures in England. I, I had a cover on the or a front page on the Sunday Times newspaper, uh, and uh, the university didn't like that very much, and they asked me to leave. Wow! So you left uni, and then. You, where did you head to London? I headed to London and I went to see the Daily Express because I didn't know them. I'd been, I'd become really the unofficial stringer for Cambridge. They, you know, they had somebody in the town, but the university and the town were fairly separate. So I'd become really the the university stringer there. And I went into the office, and they were all very pleased to see me. But hello, have a cup of tea, dear boy. And then the telephone would ring, and they say, where were we, dear boy? And then the other telephone would ring, and it was really hard to ever get a continuous conversation and then conference would get called and then the picture and say well I did want to talk to you can you can you pop in tomorrow and so I did this for three days and on the third day the other the other picture editor leant over and said well actually we're a bit short next this week can you help us out for a, for a few weeks so I, I said yes of course and it became a Daily Express photographer which must have been the first time anyone had had been given a job on a National Fleet Street paper from from being a total amateur. You hustled them. Well, it happened anyway. Life was like that then. In, it, yeah. You know, you did have to hustle and play the game, and and even to just get stringing work, it was there were so many people trying to do it. It was just the beginning of a new phase, wasn't it? In well, what was unusual at that time is there were. Um, you know, the, there was new ma new magazines opening up. There was Town Magazine, there was Queen Magazine, and then the Sunday Times Magazine. And when the Sunday Times started, they struggled to find enough photographers who were able to work in colour, because the the people Picture Post had had closed about um, I don't know five five years ago or something. Fifty seven, uh, I think. Wasn't that's it? right. So it's about five years before the Sunday Times Magazine started. And but those those photographers are not used to working in colour. And it, it sounds silly now because colour and black and white seem so, you know, it's so obvious that we work in colour. But at that time, people were used to working in black and white and there really was no photojournalism in colour. Things like Life magazine did, did all their photojournalism in black and white and they only used colour for things like fashion or occasionally for travel. And so that uh, I, I felt myself that when you saw the, the work that was going on, that a lot of, of that generation of photographers just went out and took black and white pictures with colour film in their camera, because you do really have to think in a different way. Through all of that, you sort of split your time with colour and black and white, because you are quite a prolific black and white photographer as well, aren't you, as well as... I, your... I was, well, for, yes. For the first couple of years when I started, I worked for people like Town, and that really was mostly black and white. 
And when the Sunday Times started, they wanted the photographers to shoot stories in both, which was really quite hard because mm. you needed a lot of cameras. You needed one kind of camera for wide-angle lenses and another for long lenses, and then you needed slow colour film and fast colour color, color film. So one ended up carrying an awful lot of cameras about. I was going to ask you your shooting methods between how you shot your personal work and how you shot commercial work. Well, I never made, I didn't, when you say personal work, um, I, I, I didn't really have any personal work except I did sometimes shoot stories that I thought would sell, yeah. but that was, but I didn't do sort of advertising work at all. So I didn't really have a commercial in that sense. My work was to be a magazine photographer. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, everything I shot was on that basis. And I used to use Leicas for wide-angle lenses and Nikons for long lenses because they were the best cameras in each category at the time. Um, you know, I didn't like medium format. I, I did, when I went to work on the Daily Express to start with, they gave me a Rolleiflex and it got run over by the Queen Mother's car and they never gave me another one. So from then onwards, I only used my Leicas and my Nikons. And I, I think I probably was the only photographer in Fleet Street at the time, who didn't use medium format at all, but only 35 millimeter. Then how did the Sunday Times develop? How did that come into your radar? Well, they, I knew the, the first editor was actually Mark Boxer, who he, he moved on before the first magazine. He was there for the first couple of years, I think. Um, but he had been art director at Queen magazine, so I did know him. And when, when they were starting the Colour magazine, they asked me to come in and see them. Uh, and say, was I interested? And I said, yes, very much so. And I actually did, um, I did have part of the cover of the very first issue. It was a, a picture of a footballer and it was surrounded by pictures of Gene Shrimpton's armpit taken by David Bailey. So it was a, a strange cover, but I felt right. glad to be part of the very first issue anyway. I've never seen that cover. Was it black and white, Bailey? No, it was all colour. Colour, right, but, okay. But they did do quite a lot of sort of composite covers and their argument at the time was that, that because the magazine came free with a newspaper, you didn't have to sell it on a newsstand like yeah. you would a normal magazine. Therefore, they could have sort of more interesting composite covers and things like that that, that didn't have to grab people's attention. But uh, I think they, they saw the light after a while and, and fairly soon started putting nice looking covers on with one strong picture that I actually much preferred. That must have been an amazing feeling. It was good you had, knowing you had a cover of the Sunday Times magazine. How yeah, many well, did you? How many did you have? Well, I probably I, I I had about twenty five covers over the time I worked there. Not as many as some because I think many of the covers tended to be things like fashion or celebrities, and they were neither my area. I was more into documentary shots, but I still get got I got my fair share of covers. Some of your commissions for the Sunday Times took you everywhere didn't they yeah that's right yes and they also a huge number of pages i mean i had stories on france and south america which went over two whole issues and ended up being something like 25 pages of photographs which is which was exceptional what was korea like then well that was quite a while later that was in the early 70s in fact it was the last story i did for the sunday times but it, it was slightly long-winded but i was offered a visa to north korea which nobody else had had for a long time um and uh, the sunday times said yes uh and it was an absolute it was a nightmare because you couldn't do anything without their approval and they had a minder with me 24 hours a, a day i couldn't even you know, walk out, go for a walk outside the hotel if I left my cameras behind, if, as long as they, if they didn't have their minder with me. So I ended up taking pictures out of lavatory windows and things to try and get some feeling of what the, the place looked like. So um, it, it was very interesting, but quite harrowing and one of the hardest assignments I've ever done. I'm fascinated by your Africa, white man in Africa. Yeah. yeah. What, tell me about that story and what you did there. Well, I went with a journalist called Richard West, and he also wrote a book called The, the White Tribes of Africa. It was a time when, when um, Britain was really changing its attitude to colonialism, and Harold Macmillan had given a famous speech called The Wind of Change that was blowing through Africa. So we really wanted to look at the, the white people that were still 
part of the political system in Africa, which meant obviously British colonies, Portuguese colonies, um, French colonies. The French and the British were trying to get out of Africa and Portuguese, Portugal was trying to, to stay there and obviously South Africa was trying to stay there. So it really showed the, um, the way of life of these dif different people. And we, I think we went to something like 14, 14 countries in, in about um, six weeks. So it was a lot of traveling around. All with your Lycas and Nikons. Lycas and Nikons, yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, but I and I still they still wanted black and white to some extent. But I I d decided on certain subjects being black and white subject and certain subjects being colour. So I wasn't trying to hump too many cameras around cameras around all the time. Going back to the early days, you, you mentioned Bresson. It's amazing how many photographers from that generation are really influenced by. Cartier Bresson. Was he, who else really inspired you early on? Yes, and the reason was that, that, that you know, the, the photographic establishment to me was a bit static. Everything was set up and posed, and I just loved that decisive moment photography, as Cartier Bresson described it, seeing things in real life and catching a moment. And I've always followed that approach. For example, I never wanted to go and ask people in the street if I could photograph them, because I think if you ask them, then you're destroying that natural image that is there and for the rest of my career I followed that policy to, to to just take things first and ask later if necessary whenever I could you obviously can't always do it but it it's an approach of trying to get pictures that are natural and, and off, off off kilter a little bit one thing which has always baffled me about you John is I, I never it's I always thought Magnum would be somewhere on your radar through the 70s interesting. and 80s. Yep. Well, it's interesting. You see, when I started in the early 60s, Magnum didn't have an office in London. They, they had one a sort of agent in, in in London, but there really wasn't much of a Magnum profile in London at all. Um, I became a close friend of Philip Jones Griffiths in the in the early sixties, and he joined Magnum about mid sixties. And I, I did talk, to them, I did flirt with the idea and talk to them. But at that time, I was working pretty much full time for the Sunday Times magazine, and I would have had to give half of my income to Magnum on the assignments from the Sunday Times, and that didn't make much financials sense at all as I was already working full time for the best magazine in the world I felt and yeah. what was what was Magnum going to do for me now looking back it might have been very different later but um, the other interesting thing with Magnum is I think they were a wonderful organization but around the, the early 70s when I decided to move sideways into films many Magnum photographers all over the world seeing that the the whole magazine thing was changing and becoming more commercial a lot of them uh, started doing company reports, people like Bert Glynn became very commercial. And when I look back on that period of the 70s and 80s, I was actually having a wonderful time making films all over the world. And my friends in Magnum were mostly doing effectively advertising work. So I didn't have any doubts at that time that I'd made the right decision. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I, I think I was Bert Glynn's assistant and Philip Jones Griffith's assistant on corporate assignments around the world. Yeah. And it was big money, big yeah. money. Big money, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. It's always been in my head that, I think even, as you said, later on, I just wondered, in hindsight, I wondered why he's a perfect fit for these this organisation. And you did okay. Well, I enjoyed it. As I say, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I don't think people like Philip Jones Griffiths, I don't think they were happy doing that at advertising work really it didn't fulfill them and philip went off and did stuff in cambodia and so on on the side but anyway i some people can do it and be happy and um i found it depressed me to do commercial work and i didn't really like it i think with philip he used it as a way to fund his cambodia work and vietnam and, yeah. and his work and i think he understood that and realized that he could then go out and do what he wanted to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I think, it, you know, it was a means to an end, but I think yeah. there was a market there and there was a demand for it, and yeah. they really rolled the wave of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of books, you've had your, your works published with Blue Core Press. Yeah. 
Or there any other books in the making? Well, I, I've done three books now. Yeah. All of them have been ultimately with Blue Coat Press. The first one was The North. And when I retired right. and started to archive my old pictures, I knew that The North was the, the material that stood out the most, simply because nobody else had photographed The North of England in in, in colour. And, and secondly, that a lot of people have a great nostalgia for the North, whereas things like the world are such a big subject that it's hard for people to have the same sort of association with it. So I did the North first and I archived the pictures and started to look at that. And then I was amazed to find how difficult it was to find a publisher uh, until Blue Coat Press came along and they were wonderful. Let me do everything I want. Uh, and then after that, they said, well, we've done the North, let's do the world now. So then I worked on the wind of change. And that was a much harder subject because it was so such a wide subject and so diffuse that it was really hard to know how to take it, whereas the North all just fell together in a very sort of simple way. And then the only other book I've done is a little book on, it's called an, A Very English Village, and it was a story I did for the Sunday Times uh, magazine in the mid-60s. And uh, I'd often thought of doing a little book about it, but it was just one assignment. And then sort of self-publishing came along and it suddenly became cheap. So that I did that uh, uh, last year, actually. And uh, we sold out the first edition very quickly. And then Blue Coat Press came along and said they'd like to, um, to do it as well. So that's been a nice little thing. It's not like the whole, it's not like a big book on lots of different subjects, one little one, but it's, it's nice. And I've got an opportunity to talk about it at the Hay Festival this year as well. So it's, it was nice to do. I like the North, the book. I think it shows your transition from black and white to a colour photographer, do you think? Yes, and I was very lucky because the you know I only did one colour assignment on the North in the 60s, that was the Sunday Times magazine. Um, but then in the 70s, a Geo magazine in Germany asked me to do a, a story on Manchester. And um, they, they didn't seem very happy with the story at the time. I was amazed because I found that the old North, as I knew it, was still there. And I loved it. And I spent much longer there than I should have done. But it was great when I came to put the book together because it gave me much more colour than I would have had otherwise um, if I'd just had the Sunday Times story. Geo magazine doesn't exist anymore, am I right, in England? It doesn't. No, it's gone now. This was this was in the days when it was just in German only, right. um, and then it became. I did quite a few stories for them later on when they had their French and their English versions. But it was. It's. I miss it. It's a sad loss. But um, there isn't anything at the moment to, to take their place. I love the North, the book. I I really do. Now I understand your journey. Looking at that book, I was completely bezazzled by the images, and I've reviewed it on my the camera channel and it just blew me away basically what one phrase i coined with your color work you may laugh at this but i use the word lowry light with your work that your um you know lowry the painter yeah of course yeah and every this the certain images you have with the the, the color tones the fog the grayness, the the dullness of English, and but you put this blast of colour in there, and I just coined it as the Lowry light. It just reminds uh -huh. me of a, a Lowry uh -huh. painting. Well, it obviously is quite different, but I did think long and hard before going off to the north in colour to, to shoot in colour because um, I felt that if I did it on a sunny day, that it just wouldn't work. Those cobble streets, it wouldn't have the atmosphere, the mysterious and the look of the north. Um, and yet, it was quite hard to use colour film in in the winter because it was very slow and. The, the latitude was poor, so that um, I did think long and hard, and I made the decision to, to try and shoot in rain and fog and things where I possibly could, and I think that, that helped a lot. Were you shooting Actacom? I was shooting in the, in the Sunday Times material in the 60s, I shot a film called Ectochrome X, but it, it, was, it didn't have a lot of latitude. It was fairly grainy and not terribly sharp, but... Um, uh, it did the job, but then by that time I worked for Geo in the 70s, then Kodachrome had up their speed and the quality was much better, it was sharper. So I was able to move on and use Kodachrome for that assignment. I don't think people realise how hard shooting transparency was these it, days. It, it, you, it, you used to have to be pretty accurate with your exposure and very low shutter speeds because it just was slow. And then it's in the processing as well. Did you do a lot of clip testing and testing? Uh, no, I, I didn't process it myself normally. I just sent it to a lab. Yeah. I know shooting commercially it was a nightmare. 
quite hard. Yes, I mean, later I had a lab that I shared with Philip Jones Griffiths, and um, then we did processing, but that wasn't until after I'd finished shooting it, really, pretty much. One of my favourite pictures in your North book is the lady putting her washing out and the, the composition of her in the garden hanging the washing out. Yes. Just reminds me of my grandmother, because I'm from the North. Oh. It it's almost looks like a composite of the industrial chimneys, the, almost the nuclear reactor it's... chimneys in the middle, and then the chimneys of the houses in the background. Tell us a little bit about that picture. Now, is that is that, the, is that a colour one you're talking about, is it? Black and white. Black and white. Was it a lady with her washing? I know, that was in the black country. And it was, um, yes, there was a power station in the background. Well, I was driving along and I just saw that in the distance. So I stopped the car and went up and and uh, just started taking pictures and then sort of chatted. So I was really just looking at what she was doing and catching the, the right moment. So there, there was, you know, I didn't set it up or pose it in any way. It's just what I found. How were you accessing people up there? What were you doing? Were you just wandering the streets? Well, I kind of used to, yeah, I just was wandering the streets. And I think that if you hang around looking a bit lost, I mean, I remember the uh, the one that was a double spread in the book of, of girls in curlers. I did meet those the one lady years later and she said, oh, I thought you were fooling around with no full film in the camera. So I think that if, if one appeared a bit incompetent or hopeless, people would be quite relaxed about it. And I never found a problem with people feeling threatened, yeah. really. Well, that was the cover shot, wasn't it, for the North? Uh, the book, yes, that's correct, yeah. yeah. One thing about your style I've noticed, in, especially in the North, is you've got a real eye for corners. For corners? Yes. Uh, well, it kind of holds things together, doesn't it? I mean, I always hate pictures that take your eye out of the photograph. Yeah. And um, so corners sometimes contain things. And, and I, I think in the early days, those photographers who I felt were shooting black and white with colour film in their cameras. Very often you had bright things near the edge of the frame and things that took your eye out. And I think it was quite important to try and keep your eye into the picture. And uh, anything that helped contain it in that way was good. I presume you're shooting 28mm, 35mm? A lot, yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'd have a Leica with a 28 or a 35, and then I'd have a Nikon with a 105 or a 180. So, And I never used a 50mm lens at all, really. It's, um, I just never got along with them. Obviously, composition is mega important to you, and with my observation of how you use a lot of corners in your work as well, is that you're looking for other stuff. You, you focus on your subject, but you're, you're waiting and looking for other things to come into play. Of course, yes. The whole thing is anticipation, really. Putting yourself in the right place and anticipating that decisive moment, which gives you a good image. I think your pictures are very busy. I, I've seen other people shooting that sort of stuff, and sometimes they become very quiet in their framing of, of the subject matter to use a lot of space. Your use of space, is, for me, is unbelievable. I, I think you use space really well, and... I, I like the way that you challenge a lot of narratives, one or two different narratives within your shots. You're looking to to blend in and bring in something else. And I think that really comes across with your with your work for the North. How many images did you have to choose from to narrow it down to the book? Um, well, the book was made up from eight different assignments put together. And probably each assignment, I would have maybe shot 20 rolls of film like that. So that 20 rolls would be about seven up to a thousand pictures. So, uh, I mean, probably I would have had a, a base of about 5,000 pictures from which to make that book. But obviously, that doesn't mean you consider 5,000 pictures, but you, you often shoot a lot to get one frame. And I, I felt that, I mean, the, the, the world book, The Wind of Change, there was a huge amount of material. I had to be quite drastic because, it, you know, it was just all over the place. But on the north, I... I felt really that I went through the North material and I put in every picture that I thought was good in it. So I didn't have a, I didn't have much trouble putting that book together. Whereas the Wind of Change World Book that was hugely complex because there were an awful lot of pictures which seemed to have no relationship to the other ones, and I had to chuck some of them out. There's a massive sense of community with the North Book as yes. well. Was yeah. that something you were 
trying to capture when you were out there initially? Very much so, yes. I mean, I, I the first story I did in the north was on Nelson, and I was only there for two or three days, but I remember getting out of the car and just looking around, and it seemed like a license to steal. There was so much wonderful things to look at. And I loved the, the reaction of the people. They were interested that some young man should have taken the trouble to come all the way up from the south to see them, and they didn't feel I was trying to exploit them or take advantage of them. They were just uh, felt a little touch that I was interested in them. So it was a wonderful place to start. And I, I just always liked the people from the north and found I had a very nice response from them. So I just followed my nose, really. Was that very different to what you knew as you were growing up? Was there something about focusing on that part of the world? Not really. I mean, I to me, um, I think photo- I've always been found photographing things near home a bit difficult because they they appear so normal and so ordinary. And when I went to Nelson, to me, it was exotic in the way that going to darkest Africa might have been exotic. It was something that was interesting and new and different, and it sort of hit me in the stomach. And I thought, wow, I love this. And uh, it was just an instinctive reaction, really. What's next for you, then? Well, um, I, you know, I'm taking it a bit easy with the work. I'm still... Uh, selling a few prints and having a few exhibitions now and again. And I'm, I'm um, doing a talk at the Hay Festival this year. So I, I keep involved in the photography in that sense. The the filmmaking, it's strange because once you've made that film, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to whoever put up the money. And uh, mostly they don't get shown again on television. So although the memories are there and the material is there, I don't have any to do with it, whereas the still photographs are around and, you know, hard, hardly a day passes when I don't get a, an email from somebody asking about, you know, whether they can buy a print or saying could they get a book or they like the book or something. So so there's quite a lot going on with, with the still photographs, but not with the movies. Oh, we're not going to see a big retrospective exhibition? Well, obviously, I'd love it, but, you know, those things don't seem to be happening at the moment. Um, you know, I, I had an exhibition in Paris in the autumn, and it was a small gallery, but actually they, they've done very well. They've sold quite a lot of prints, so it is interesting that the, the French are particularly interested in pictures of the north, north of England. But, um, I mean, I think, you know, Take Britain did that wonderful Don McCullin show, and, you know, I, I'm realistic. I know I'm not going to get something like that because I'm not as well known, but it's, it's nice to have a, a small, small following anyway. Who was the biggest influence with you as a photographer and a filmmaker? Um, well, as a photographer, Cartier Bresson, I think, certainly was. But um, other individuals who I met, I mean, I met Larry Burroughs and helped him out a bit when he came to Cambridge. And, and Bert Glynn as well, I met when he came to Cambridge for Holiday Magazine. And he was very encouraging. And he, he was the man who re- really made me re- realise that there, there was a career to be had in travelling the world, as he did. And he did some wonderful assignments for Holiday Magazine. So I found him very inspiring. I think Bert Lynn was a very underrated photographer. He's not underrated with me, that's all I can say. No, with me, no. With me neither. I thought he was a fa- his, his Havana He's stuff brilliant. was just that's mind-blowing. Right. That's right. What are you looking at now in terms of who, who are your sort of go-to people now well, who you look at and think, wow, it's all changed so much. I mean, there, there, there's been a recent, I can't remember what it's called now, a book published on British photography. And, and on the whole, um, you know, I don't want to sound negative, but as time went on, there's less decisive moment, more um, um, set up pictures of people standing in the middle of frame looking at the camera, which is just not really my style. Now, there are good things going on. And, and for example, I'm sharing a slot at the Hay Festival with a girl called Billy, Ch- Billy Charity, who's photographed her family and friends during lockdown. And a lot of those pictures are full of spirit and excitement. But I think it's happening on a much smaller scale now. People are because of the costs are so different and they, uh, um, they're able to do all these pictures of their friends and families and maybe they don't get to the point of being seen by a lot of people. And so that there is a lot of interesting stuff around, but it's, the outlets are different. They're, it's not, they're not published in magazines in the way they used to be in the 60s. And, and uh, there's stuff on Instagram and, uh, and small self-published books. So there are, there are lovely things around, but it's just very different and... And it's not really my style quite, but it's it's interesting to see. And it's the final game for Blue Cold Press as well, which is very sad. Is it? I didn't know that. Uh, I think maybe he told me that um, he's done some lovely things. He has. Yeah, I think it's his final year. Now, he's, he's, this is the 2022 will 
mark the end of Colin doing it. Yes, I mean, I see it's different. When, when, so, when it's so cheap to self-publish, it's quite hard to make money out of publishing books on a serious level. I yeah. mean, Thames and Hudson are doing a big book on British photography, and I've, I've, got, I've got a few in that, I believe. But um, it takes somebody with a big, big resources to do something like that. John, it's been wonderful talking to you. I could talk to you all day. Pleasure listening to your stories and just getting a little insight into who you are as a person and how you connected with the world do your photography and filmmaking thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me well thank you very much i've enjoyed talking to you thank you have a lovely day okay bye 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 we are floored we are bound down see us careless cold see us steal the dawn we are storm We are storm See us born, see us Wind down, see us Fly